So first off, just want to say, number one, thanks for everybody who are logging in today. Um, this is a part of an educational series of webinars that I've been putting on for essentially about the last year. And what I try to do is I try to bring in experts in the industry. That could be like Robert, attorneys. Um, there could be, uh, we brought in Enrique Flores about loan servicing on our last webinar. Uh, and we've talked about uh, other topics such as uh, fund control. And all of this is posted on our Talamar Financial YouTube site. So if you haven't been to our YouTube site, definitely check it out where I post a lot of these educational webinars and other content about investing in trustees and investing in mortgage funds and whatnot. And really what I'm trying to do is not only educate you, uh, the investor or individual that's involved in the private lending industry, but really pull back the curtain. Because I still feel like it's one of these industries that has kind of like a, I wouldn't say the term black cloud over it, but it, you know, it is, it's kind of cloaked in mystery. So um, I want to unveil that all and, and show that it is a growing and vibrant industry that, that um, you should really be involved with and, and learn more about which is one of the reasons why I wanted to bring Robert Finley on today. Uh, we're gonna talk about default interest and how recent uh, changes are actually just uh, um, legislation and court rulings have affected how private lenders can charge default interest. So Robert, I'll give you a minute to uh, introduce yourself and uh, talk about what the subject we're gonna talk about today. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Brock. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us today. So Robert Finley with uh, law firm Wright, Finley & Zach. We've been uh, around for 22 years now, and we primarily do mortgage-related litigation and compliance uh, with a special emphasis on the private lending space. Um, I'm in our California office, and that's where most of our attorneys are, but we do um, have some clients in other states throughout the Western U.S., uh, we have bankruptcy, eviction, we do you know, receiverships and you know, after guarantors and all that fun stuff as well. Um, it, my side gig, uh, also I'm general counsel for the California Mortgage Association and have done that for about five years. Mm -hmm. And um, default interest is something that uh, I spent a lot of time on in my career, but the last two years uh, I've spent, or about a year and a half, I've spent more time than I ever, ever wanted to uh, based <laughs> on what we're going to talk about here today. One last thing I'll just throw in there, you know, we'll talk about the law here and, and I'll provide some input, but you know, this is all just a discussion here and none of it's meant to be relied on as legal advice. Talk to your, you know, give me a call if you want, talk to your own attorney uh, before, you know, um, jumping off the, uh, the dock after listening to what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, thank you absolutely for that disclosure. Um, obviously, this is an educational webinar. Uh, we're not trying to sell you in any investments, uh, any investments that you do decide to make talk to your uh, either attorney, wealth manager, or whatnot. So um, thanks, Robert, for that uh, disclosure. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. But, but before, one thing I wanted to mention is uh, this educational webinar is, I want to set it up as a discussion between you, uh, the viewer, and us as well. I don't want it to just be a lecture about the laws. So if you've got any questions, um, down on the bottom, there's a Q&A section. Feel free to submit questions there, and I'll go ahead and manage that, Robert, um, on behalf of the discussion, and then I'll bring those questions up as they pop up. So please feel free to ask questions. As I always say, if you have a question or you need clarification about a subject, I guarantee you there's somebody else that has probably that similar question or, or needs clarification. So please, please use the Q&A button down there. This is what these educational webinars are about. All right, so let's get started here. So default interest. Uh, we all know it's been a huge part of the private lending industry. Uh, it's one way for us as private lenders to kind of defray the cost of going through a default, uh, pro going through a foreclosure process. As we all know, in the state of California, it can get pretty expensive. And then also in the past, I think some lenders may have used it as a way of increasing revenue. Uh, but I think that that obviously has, has gone away with this new legislation and court rulings. So, um, Robert, can you kind of just generally take us through what is default interest and why is it not as easy to charge anymore in the state of California? Yeah, no, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to. And, and, and you're correct. I mean, 
default interest has been around for a long time, and, and I'm not going to tell you it's going away by, by our discussion here, but definitely decision that came down in September of 2022 has, has changed the landscape of what you can and can't do. The, the decision is, is called, uh, the name is Honshiru. Uh, that's what we call it. It was Honshiru versus so-and-so. I can't remember who it was, but Honshiru is what we call it <laughs> a few times. Um, so, but to, to, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but in order to understand the decision and how it affects you and affects your ability to charge default interest, I think it's important to understand kind of a little bit of the legal framework around default interest and how we got here. So, um, uh, I, I'm going to take you, take you back to 1894 to start off. Uh, All right, we're going back. We're going and, back. Yeah. Which is not when I first started practicing law, if anyone's <laughs> wondering. But um, it's California Supreme Court weighed in, and this is important because the California Supreme Court weighed in first time on default interest. And in, in that decision, they said, charging default interest on a matured loan. So the loan, loan matures and you charge default interest, not a problem. And that is still the law today. So that's you know one big takeaway. That has not changed by the Honshiru decision. Uh, that is still good law. And so when we talk about default interest, just to, just to clarify, we're talking default interest on late payments, um, and default interest on maturity defaults, on, on payment defaults and maturity defaults. Yeah, or actually even any default, actually, Rox. Okay. So, you know, the defa default interest, you know, most contracts will say that if the loan goes in default for any reason, it could be non-monetary, it could be you fail to pay property taxes, it could be violation of the due on sale provision, meaning you transfer it to someone, you know, some other, someone other than the borrower, it could be missing a payment. And it could okay. be when the loan matures. There's so many different ways that, that defaults occur. But historically, when that default occurred, um, lenders would charge default interest right then and there. And so the classic default interest, like in the Honshrew case, uh, well, the normal default interest, you know, let's say your interest rate's 10%, loan goes in default, and um, you can then under the contract charge 15%, let's say. Yeah, yeah. An extra 5%. Uh, it might be an extra 10%. It just depends on your contract. But that's that's what we're talking about here. Okay, so keep going, keep going. Yeah, no, no worries. So uh, moving out of the 1800s, uh, okay. we go. We, we we flash forward to 1998, and in 1998, okay. the Supreme Court weighed in again. Now, Supreme Court being our California Supreme Court, mm -hmm. and there they did they held that default interest is a liquidated damage clause. And you may think of liquidated damage clauses from the standpoint of like if you ever. Uh, go to buy a house. You, know, you mm -hmm. put down a deposit, and in the, in that deposit, the, that contract's going to it's going to provide for liquidated damages, and it's going to say that the approved liquidated damage amount is the amount of your deposit. And if you pull out of the deal, then you're you're going to lose your deposit. That's kind of most classic liquidated damage. So the the Supreme Court said that uh, default interest is kind of like a, a liquidated damage provision. Okay, and it will generally be deemed. Um, uh, allowable, and you can go ahead and charge default interest, uh, assuming that the amount that you're charging bears a reasonable relationship to the range of actual damages that the parties could have anticipated would flow from the breach of the contract. So at the time you entered into this loan agreement, um, you're looking at it and say, okay, um, once this goes into default, it's going to cost me time, money, um, I may, you know, it's may um, uh, the delay in foreclosing, you know, all, all not the cost of foreclosure because you recoup that, but anything that any of the, the the monetary and intangible costs associated with that default, all of that, um, um, the, the default interest you're charging must bear a reasonable relationship. And so, what courts would do is they'd look at it and say, okay, you're charging twenty percent default interest on top of ten percent. There's no way that is a reasonable relationship to the, the loss that you thought you might suffer as a result of the default. And that's how courts looked at it for, for forever. And that's how the Supreme Court looked at it in 1998. So you so the takeaway there is default interest must bear a reasonable relationship to the anticipated loss that you thought you might suffer once a, once the loan went into default. And that's take away this that. idea that it is a revenue generating portion of the business. Yes. No. It, it, you're not, we're not supposed to look at it as if it's a revenue generation, uh, revenue generator. But instead, what 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 lender and some lenders did that back in the day. But really, what most lenders do is they look at it. Um, default interest. It's it's a it's a deterrent to the borrower defaulting. Mm -hmm. Or if they know their interest rates ten percent now and it's going to go to fifteen, that's a deterrent. And yeah. then 
Um, the other real use of it is once you start charging it is it's a, a huge incentive for that borrower to pay off your loan or reinstate the or bring the loan current or uh, you know refinance you out, whatever it might be, sell the property. Uh, it, it, it's a major uh, incentive to cure the default. And I'll and I'll and I'll kind of caveat that is in in the real world when we have conversations with borrowers that are on the cusp of a default, I will tell you that conversation. Uh, when you start bringing up default interest does have an impact in how they, they react. Yeah. And, the, and the fact that when you start to talk about and just educate them, I'm not saying that I, you know, we're using this as um, you know, threatening it. It's just educating them about what is the provisions of the loan documents. And you start to say, talk about default interest. It really has an impact on their decision of keeping that loan current. Yeah. I will tell you that it, 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 it does. I, I, I totally Absolutely believe it. Care it. And, and, and that's the context that we're going to talk about with this Honshu decision. It wasn't a matured loan. It was a missed payment. And the lender went ahead and charged default interest on the entire unpaid principal balance once, once the, the borrower missed the payment. And that's that was normal. That's what lenders were doing for decades and decades until 2022. And um, the this California Supreme Court said that's okay as long as there's that reasonable relationship. So we'd always be arguing in bankruptcy court or in court, is it reasonable or not? And sometimes some lenders were greedy and they got, you know, they got in trouble. But for the most part, it, it wasn't much of a problem uh, mm -hmm. as long as people weren't greedy. And 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 that's where Hantru came in is is it curtailed charging of default interest on that payment default. Okay. So just, just into, I don't know if you know these numbers, but what was the lender charging in that case? Yeah, it wasn't much. And that's the really scary part. It was, so their interest rate on it was eight, four, I think it was 8.5 or 8.49. Okay. That's, that's and then, right. um, after the default, after the missed payment, they bumped the uh, interest rate up to 9.99. So the default interest that spread, what I would call the default interest rate was only 1.5%. It wasn't much at all. Oh, that's nothing. Okay. Yeah. And and what the court held though is in that in that case in Huntru is that anytime you charge default interest on the entire unpaid principal balance. And again, because it's the payment. Yeah. Following a payment default. Yep. Yep. They've missed one payment or two payments. Doesn't matter. Um, once you charge default interest on the entire unpaid principal balance, let's say your loan's a million dollars, they missed one payment of ten thousand dollars. Historically, we would charge default interest on that entire one one million principal balance. Honshu said, when there's a payment default, you can't charge default interest on the entire unpaid principal balance. Okay, and what can you charge interest on? Okay, so we know from from our 1894 case that we could charge default interest on the entire unpaid principal balance upon maturity of the loan. We know okay. that. And that, that has not changed and nothing that um, Honshiru uh, said or did um, affected that. In fact, they even said, we're not going to, we're not, that issue is not before us. Okay. So that issue is still out there. You can charge default interest on the entire, uh, upon maturity of the loan, not an issue. Okay. You can also charge default interest on the missed payment. So in my example, $10,000 missed payment, let's call it interest only missed payment. Uh, interest only uh, payment, they miss it. You could charge default interest on that missed payment. Okay. One caveat there, though, is that is comp that is comp actually compound interest. And even though Honshiru said, yeah, you can go ahead and charge it on the missed payment, uh, the, um, they never they didn't get into the issue of whether that is compound interest and whether your agreement allows for that. So before charging default interest on a missed interest payment or a portion of a yeah. missed interest payment, Make sure your document allows for compound interest. That's a quick, easy check. A lot of private lending documents do, and then you're fine. So now you can charge default interest on that missed $10,000 payment. It's not what, what you want to hear. It's not what lenders want to hear, but at least uh, it, it's something that you can do. And if once they miss another payment, you can charge default interest on that other payment as well. Now, what about late fees? How does late fees? So late fees, you can go, still go ahead and charge late fees. Uh, your late fee, though, needs to be based on the, the missed payment, not the entire unpaid principal balance, because you're going to run into the same issue that they did in Honshu. 
Okay, so just to cover, just so that everyone, uh, or, or that I have clarification, we're talking about missed payment, default interest, we're charging or calculating default interest on the amount of that missed payment. That's okay. And if the loan's matured, you can do it on the entire pr principal balance. Okay. Now, what happens if we start getting more missed payments? Let's say you're now you're three months of missed payments. So three months of missed payments, then you can, you, you can be charging default interest on each of those missed payments. Okay. So okay. What, what, what you're going to need is a someone who is a mathematician to start figuring out all these calculations of what you can and can't do. Yes. And, and don't call your lawyer for that, or at least don't call this lawyer. <laughs> Um, one, one thing I will say, a question that comes up quite often related to that, uh, Brock, is, is you know, a lot of our clients are frustrated because historically they've charged default interest on the entire unpaid principal balance yeah. when that payment's missed. And like you mentioned, that really is a conversation that brings the borrower to the table uh, to, to cure the default. Well, we don't have that anymore. Um, so so it's, it, it's very frustrating for our clients. So sometimes clients call and they're like, okay, well, I'm charging default interest on the monthly payments. I'm going to go to foreclosure. I'm going to start the foreclosure because they're delinquent. And now they're three payments behind or two payments behind. Often what I, I, what I say is look at it and say, when does your loan mature? Yeah. If your loan matures, you know, if you're two months behind and your loan's going to mature in another month, you're better off um, waiting and starting your foreclosure based on the maturity of the loan and charging default interest upon the maturity of the loan yeah. than you would be starting the foreclosure one month early. Now, if you're if again, you're I, maturity I is six months out, that's a different story. I think from, again, from a practical sense, I hear you. Um, you know, we have cases where, um, or, or situations where a borrower may be coming right up onto that maturity. Um, they don't want to make that final payment. Or, and you know what happens a lot that we see is they're in the process of refinancing the loan. And they don't want to make that final payment because the payoff demand on the, on the, the refinance is kind of incorporated in it. So now they've gone beyond that 30 day, uh, that, that 30 day payment requirement. Um, and it becomes for us, it becomes a 30 day late. And I think that, and I, I really try to talk to borrowers and say, I understand that you're refinancing the property or you're in the process of selling it, but you don't want a 30 day late um, on your payment history because it can significantly impact your ability to refinance the property. Yes, you may be in the middle of a refinance, but it will negatively impact your ability. Maybe not even on this refinance, if they look at the payment history again, um, um, or if you go and can't get this refinance and have to go out again. So yeah. from a practical aspect, I, I try to educate the borrower and say, don't let it get beyond those, that 30 days. Um, and if, if we're in a situation where there is a maturity coming up, that's kind of the direction of, the, of that conversation. Is we're, uh, you're gonna have a maturity default on both payment, or I'm sorry, a default on both the payment and the maturity default, and we're probably going to act more on the, the maturity default. And I feel like if you spend the time educating the bar, again, I go back to educating the borrower and just saying, hey, this is what it was agreed to. Here's the loan document. I find it's a lot better of an approach than sitting there and just, even though we do, but just, you know, bombarding them with default notices, default emails, default. Uh, com conversations, conversation is key. <clears throat> and conversation also, I think, helps avoid problems down the road because, um, keep in mind that once that notice of default is recorded, the borrower is inundated with law firms reaching out, promising to help them avoid foreclosure. Is, is your lender screwing you? Is your lender you know, doing this? Is your lender doing that? And that's not just on the consumer space like it used to be. That's on the, uh, on the um, uh, business purpose space as well. In fact, we just, uh, um, one of our clients and, and uh, you know, a, a colleague of, of Brock and I, he sent me a letter that came in the mail because they'd already foreclosed on a piece of property from a law firm that we are up against all the time. And it was a pure solicitation saying, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, I, I can stop your foreclosure. I can delay the foreclosure. I can do all of these things. And we kept it. We actually sent it off to the state bar uh, because it, it we, we, we believed it was a uh, inappropriate solicitation. But those are all out there. So that's what the borrower is hearing. And if they talk to those attorneys, the attorneys are in their ear saying, oh, did your lender do this? Did your lender do that? If if you're communicating like Brock's talking about with that borrower, the borrower is less likely to go to that dark side, I think. Not gonna, not not all the time, but I think they're more less likely to go to the dark side and they'll be more likely to work with you. Absolutely. Uh, two questions came in. Um, this has to more uh, regarding default. Yeah, I may have the answer for this, but the question is, will building code violations trigger default 
and unauthorized construction trigger a default? I imagine it's look at your loan documents. Yeah, so, so for the code violations, it would depend on your loan docs. I don't see that one in there a ton, but uh, in, in most loan docs, but um, there's always a waste provision in everyone's everyone's loan docs. <clears throat> and that waste is, you know, generally you cannot, you know, commit waste against the property. What is waste? You know, it, it's up for debate. It depends on your judge. It depends on, uh, you know, a, a jury that may be listening to it. But there are certain certain things that are, are you know, if you're really letting, if you're, you know, if you, the place just needs a paint job, that's not issue, not an issue. But when you get into code violations, depending on how extreme those code violations are, that can be something you can use to be deemed called waste. And then you can use, even if your agreement doesn't say code violations equal default, waste does equal default and code, well, code, code violation equals waste, waste equals default. That would be the argument there. You know, it brings up a good point. I got, um, I, I, I didn't directly do this loan, but I did have a conversation with a colleague and, it, and this was, you know, when, when cannabis lending was a big thing, it still kind of is, but it doesn't make as much in the headlines where you, you do a loan, not for cannabis use, but the, all of a sudden the, you find that the, uh, the, the borrower owner is starting to use the property for cannabis use. Yeah. Um, and, and that I know is a big discussion topic in our industry. That could yeah, be, that could be another webinar in itself. Yeah. <laughs> and, and actually, we've come across that, and, and we argue, because there, most deeds of trust will have a provision that you can't do anything unlawful with your yep. property. And so we then look to the federal law, where it's still unlawful, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to you know, grow marijuana. So, um, I, you know, that's going to be an interesting one to see how it plays out. I think whether you win or lose on that might depend on how much pot your judge smokes. So. <laughs> Uh, the other question, <laughs> the other question though, about uh, unauthorized construction. So if someone's building an ADU on their property, that's going to enhance your value. I don't think you're going to be able to clear, to, you know, call that a default, but if someone tears down the, the building, which is something we see quite often uh, without your authorization, that hundred um, percent, you usually will be deemed a, a uh, violation of your, of your loan docs. And I don't think I've seen a, a set of loan docs that I couldn't argue that demoing the piece of property without your permission is a is a violation. So we've seen that in the residential homes where someone um, uh, decides that they want to go ahead and you know build a new house on the pro on the property without your permission. Uh, and then we also seen it in the, definitely in the uh, commercial space where they want to tear down a parking. I, I got one right now, a parking lot, and they want to build seventy seven units on it. Mm -hmm. And that's fine if they complete the 77 units, but in between your, your security has been severely uh, um, damaged. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, that comes up a lot from a, from a legal aspect, but moving that into a practical aspect, we see a lot of that. So we do a lot of what we call bridge loans. So loans secured on you know, an existing property may have a single family home, but the value, you know, the, the intention for the borrower is to build, you know, let's just say a 50 unit apartment building. And we have an explicit conversation and in the document stating you cannot tear down the existing prop, uh, the, the, the existing house in this case, yeah. um, and, and because there is value there. So uh, that that does come up, and that's a good question to ask if you're investing in trustees and, and it's a bridge loan with the intention of some future development project. You know, does the bar is the borrower aware that we cannot uh, uh, tear down the existing structure? That's a good question to have if you're investing in trust deeds. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about the, the ruling came out. What was this? When was this? 2023? Uh, September 2022. It was, a, it was a while ago. There was, and then they tried to challenge it at the next level. Um, we actually, uh, on behalf of the California Mortgage Association and other groups, filed a brief uh, hoping the Supreme Court would look at it. They, they refused. And so this is good law. This is it, 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 this is it. There's, yeah. no, there's no going. There's, there's no, no changing, changing right now. Yeah. So what happens before the legislation occur, uh, or, or this ruling? Before the case? Yeah. Well, I, and that kind of brings us back to what we were talking about before the, the questions came in is, so what we know we can and we can't do. So Honshru basically said we can't charge default interest on the entire unprincipled balance following a simple payment default. They missed mm -hmm. their monthly payment. You can't charge default interest on the entire unpaid principal balance which is what everyone was doing before, you can't do that. So if any takeaway from, from today's discussion, you cannot do that. And then you asked before, what can we do? We know, so we know what we can't do. And what we can do is charge default interest on the missed payment 
and okay. we can charge defaults interest on a matured loan. There is some debate and wiggle room in between. Uh, and and where that where that is 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 and this oft, often depends on everyone you know the investor's risk tolerance level, um, desire to maybe set new case law. Um, there you know uh, it's it's going to be investor by investor. And I would say twice a week I have calls with investors asking about other ways of charging default interest because they want to get their borrowers' attention. So the 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 wiggle wiggle room or the unknown area is. Let's say you have a non-monetary default. So you you it is um, so they won't provide you with their sure. their, their um, uh, taxes or their 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 the LLC tax records. Uh, they they transfer title to somebody else. There's a number of different non-monetary defaults. Those are a couple that popped in my head. So non-monetary default, and you're calling the loan due due to that non-monetary default. Yep. And when you call it due, you then accelerate the loan. Okay, so the loan is accelerating. The entire amount is now due and owing. Okay, I got it. Ar arguably, if you charge default interest on that accelerated loan, that's a arguably akin to a matured loan. Yep. So again, a common term in the industry is acceleration, accelerate the maturity. So you have a, you have a default, non-monetary default, then you consider the, the loan matured right there. You've accelerated that maturity date to the date that you choose. Yeah, exactly. And, and given that, you know, using the example of the uh, unauthorized transfer of the property. So someone sell, you know, LLC transfers the property to some, you know, some stranger and that causes you concern because that's not your borrower. That's a violation. Which, which is common, oh, yeah. but, uh, which is a lot, which is very common in, in, if there's a relation, if they've got two partners in an LLC, they get it in a dispute and they decide we're going to split, split ways. And all of a sudden one takes you know, the LLC into his own name. The, the property yes. was out there. Yeah. And, and that may be okay. It may not be, but if it's not okay with you, that's a violation of your, of your, um, mm -hmm. of your, or your loan agreement. And it's a default. So yeah. what you would do in that situation, you'd send out a, a letter saying you violated the due on sale provision. There's no cure. Cause even if they transfer it back, they've already violated it. So they can't cure it. And then you say, okay, I'm going to accelerate the loan. And yeah. so in, instead of monthly payments being due now, the full $1 million is due. And there's nothing the borrower can do about it. And if you start foreclosure, you're not foreclosing based on a missed payment. You're foreclosing on the fact that the entire loan was accelerated and they didn't pay it. So okay. the argument out there in relation to default interest is now that I've accelerated the loan, can I charge default interest on the entire unpaid principal balance? And the answer is we don't know. But if I were to go into court with that argument, I would make the argument that that is more akin to a charging default interest on a matured loan, which we know from 1894 is, is allowed. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's the argument I would make. So non-monetary default leads to acceleration, which leads to them not paying off the loan, which then, the, so the entire balance is due, charging default interest on that entire unpaid principal balance. I can't tell you that a court's gonna agree that that's, a, that's allowable. I'm just telling you that I, I, I'm able to make a, legitimate argument in court. And I think I can get around the Honshrew decision because number one, Honshrew dealt with a monetary default. I'm dealing with a non-monetary default. Mm -hmm. um, number two, Honshrew didn't deal with an accelerated loan. I'm dealing with an accelerated loan. So I think I can at least get the judge to look past Honshrew and okay. then look back at the original rule, which I mentioned before, which is, is there a reasonable relationship? Am I greedy or not? And so my hope is that someone along the way raises this argument and that we that when we when it actually gets raised and actually gets up to the court of appeals, it was someone charging a five percent default interest rate, not a twenty percent one, because that while legally it shouldn't make a difference, it does in the court's mind. And yeah, I, I, well, if it's twenty percent default interest, we're probably going to get a bad ruling. If it's only five percent, maybe we get a good ruling on it that affects everybody. So that's yeah. one, that's one of the wiggle room. That's one of the there's one other one I'll get to after your question, but that's the one. The, uh, where our clients are coming, you know, the ones that want to be aggressive are being a little bit more aggressive, understanding there is a risk. Okay. So we, we've kind of discussed this case. It, it, we, we fully aware that nothing is going to, right now there's nothing going to change unless there's some legislative change that, that is voted upon. Um, are you seeing now a lot of litigation 
over this issue now. And we talked about like, yeah, again, we're, we're seeing a lot of letters and postcards going out from defend, for, from attorneys that will defend borrowers, but are you seeing a lot of it hitting the hitting courts right now? I am a, a lot, a ton. I mean, I, I, you know, I used to have maybe occasionally once every couple of years, a default interest issue, uh, often in the bankruptcy context. And now we probably have a dozen different default interest cases going right now involving private lenders. It, it's, it's a big issue. And the, and the borrower's attorneys are aware of it. Okay. Uh, and not necessarily the borrower's attorneys that are out solicita- soliciting like those, you know, the bottom feeders, I'll call them that, that we're sending those letters. But, uh, you know, a lot of your, your, your borrowers are LLCs and they're sophisticated business people or developers or whatever. So they have oh, access so to they, attorneys. They're aware. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and yeah, everybody knows about the default interest issue right now. And so because the borrowers know about it, they are, um, they're filing suits over it and they're, and they're, and they're challenging it if you're trying to charge it. But one, one, one thing I'll kind of come back to some of the litigation and wh- what type of litigation, but one other thing in the, in the, if I could, in the, in the wiggle room area question that we get. So I explained that if it's a non-monetary default leads to acceleration and then I'm charging default interest. Mm-hmm. If that happens, number one is, is you're charging default interest from the date of acceleration, not from the date of the default, which is different than what people have done in the past. Okay. And then, but I, I've gotten this question several times. Well, fine. If I, if I can do it in that situation, when a borrower monetary def- makes a monetary default, misses a payment, you're also, when you file your notice of default, you're accelerating the loan. Yep. So if I can charge default interest upon an accelerated loan following a non-monetary default, why can't I do fair it following question. a monetary yeah, default? Question. Uh, and first off, my first answer is I didn't say you could do it following a non-monetary. I said, if you want to be aggressive, you could try to do it. Yeah, yeah. And there's risk. The re- I don't like it at all in the context of a monetary default, even though the legal argument is similar, because it just looks too similar to the Honshru case. The Honshru was a monetary default, mispayment. And I could see a judge saying, oh, this is just the same exact thing. Yeah. You're just trying to get around it. This is bullshit. Yeah. So I, I don't recommend that to clients. But I have clients that do it. They say, I'm willing to take the risk. I'm going to go ahead and do it. So but those are the two wiggle room areas. Is It relates to the acceleration. Um, I, 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 if it was my money, I would stick to the non-monetary. I wouldn't touch the monetary default uh, acceleration argument. Okay. Um, back to the litigation. What we're seeing is... Borrow uh, is there are lenders out. A lot of lenders have changed their approach to default interest. The vast majority. Okay. So, um, but there are still some out there that don't know about this law change, or don't care about it, or got bad advice from you know some attorney who doesn't do this on a daily basis. And uh, so we're seeing litigation filed against those uh, lenders for charging default interest. We're. And, and and often in those we work out some sort of short short payoff things like that, uh, or or we waive the default interest. Type of negotiation. Yeah, but some of the borrowers are are being aggressive, and not just willing to accept the you know just fine don't charge me default interest. They they want they want a little piece of flesh um, from you for asking for default interest that you're legally we're not entitled to. Okay. And. Um, uh, the other some area, of, well, wouldn't they have to demonstrate liquidated da- or some type of damages? Uh, yes, yeah, that's our argument that they would, but they try to uh, tie it into breach of some other s- statutes. So, if you demand money, just generally speaking, um, if you demand money you're not entitled to, that's a problem. And in the consumer world, of course, you have the FDCPA and all of that. We're not dealing with that, but. Even without those statutes, if you demand money that you're not entitled to, someone, you know, you're they owe you a million dollars, and you say you owe me one point two million dollars, that, um, well, uh, there's going to be a statute that that violates, and there's going to be potential exposure with doing that. So what some of these borrowers are arguing, and they're and the better attorneys that are hiring that they're uh, that they're representing them, they're arguing that, um, the 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 charging of uh, the, the, the demand for the ex, extra money, just saying, I'm, I'm charging you $200,000 of default interest, and then say, oh, no, uh, no, I won't charge it. I'll waive it. That that just the demand alone violates their, their rights and their types of damages. I disagree. Uh, we take the position all the time that that's, that, that, that's incorrect, that you have it, that, that just the demanding it is not going to be a, uh, a violation of any law or statute or contract. But We'll see how that plays out. So um, 
I tell my I tell my clients is because someone will say, well, I'm just going to I'm going to demand default interest, and then later on, if they complain, I'll waive it. I uh, don't do that. Don't charge. Don't demand it. Um, you know, under the concept of the mispayment and everything we're talking about, what the default interest you can't charge, which is on the entire unpaid principal balance yeah. following that default. In that concept, I say don't charge it with the idea you're going to waive it because uh, it's too risky and you could you could end up getting sued. And even if you win the lawsuit, you've now spent a bunch of money on the lawsuit, mm -hmm. which you don't want to do. So the other area where we're seeing litigation is actually on default interest that was charged before September 22 or before people figured out this, realized this new law and changed their procedures. So like I have a case where default in, the loan was paid off in August of 2022. And there was a couple hundred thousand dollars of default interest that was paid off. The argument that the, these borrowers' attorneys are making is that the Honshiru decision just clarified existing law. It didn't change the law. Okay. And um, therefore, what you did in August of 2022 is still a violation. Okay. And I want my default interest back. We are arguing on behalf of our clients, no, 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 no. Honshiru significantly changed the, the, the landscape out there. It altered the law and therefore it doesn't kick, it didn't kick in until September 23rd, 2022 when it went into effect. And what was done before is, is uh, you can't get your default interest back. Wow. I'll tell you that there is a, um, you know, there, there's, there are attorneys out there taking that position and, and I think we're going to win on it at the end of the day, but you know, we're in litigation and, and that's expensive. So sometimes, you know, we may end up, you know, some of these cases may settle, um, uh, you know, I, I want to see this it go up to the court of appeals level where a court of appeals could say, no, 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 that this was new law and it's not retroactive. Uh, but I want to let people know that that risk is out there. I'm not tell, I'm not going to tell you to go back and refund all your default interest to every, you know, everyone for the last four years, which would be the statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. But I want you to know that risk is out there. And, um, uh, well, yeah. I, I'm interested to see the outcome of that case. Yeah. I'm interested to see it here. So maybe we'll get you back on for a third time so we can. We can chat about that. Question that came in. Um, question is, what percentage default rate are you personally seeing most lenders charge? So is there some type of, you know, it, what what is standard out there right now? And what would you recommend? Yeah, no, I can definitively answer that question, that it's somewhere between 1% and 20%. <laughs> I know that wasn't the answer <laughs> that the, uh, anyone wanted to hear, but I'm not joking. So there, I, there's no, it's I saw all one the other day, it was 25%. Okay. So um, now keep in mind when I say that is so just for our listeners, that is egregious. Uh, I, that, that I is agree. You would have a difficult time arguing that case in front of a judge. I think you would have a difficult time. Yes. Um, so uh, but hey, keep in mind when we're talking, when I say default interest, I'm talking about the gap between whatever your interest rate now is. OK. And what you're adding on because of the default. So um, the most common numbers I see, honestly, are between four to five percent. Okay. I don't I don't know if there were some discussions along there's no case that says that. Yeah. But there's that's kind of where I think a lot of uh lenders who didn't want to be greedy mm -hmm. but wanted to have this um uh, the, the, this some some sort of um number that goes on there that makes it a little bit um harder for the a deterrent to the default and an encouragement to reinstating or bring a loan current. Four to five percent, not forty-five percent, four to five percent. So you take your 10% loan. Default goes into place, and now you're charging fourteen or fifteen percent. Uh, there's no case that comes down that says four or five is okay. There's no case that says eight is not okay. Yeah. Uh, and and and, and uh, even if you know, it, yeah. So there's no there's no definitive number, but that's kind of where I think most people feel comfortable. Definitely single digits is better. Single digits is better. Okay. So we're again we're we, we've kind of established what this case is, what we can do, uh, kind of what uh, default rate. We can potentially charge, though it's still gray, between one and twenty percent. So stick with single digits if you can. What what can a lender like myself and a private lender out there uh, do to protect ourselves to make sure that we don't get stuck in this very expensive litigation as a result of default? Yeah. So there's there's kind of two fronts where I'd say what you can do. Number number one is um, we we've, we've reviewed a lot of our clients' loan docs and specifically the in the default interest rate provision to maximize your ability to charge it mm -hmm. and to um, 
maximize the explanation, the justification for why you're charging it. Okay. So I would have, um, you know, you know, make sure that whoever you're investing in has gone out and had that default interest rate provision um, beefed up. Let's call it that. Yep. Not that not that the ones that were in there before were bad, uh, but I think there's ways to beef them up, and we've done that for some clients. So that's number one. <clears throat> um, number two is uh, when you're working on a mo modification, a loan modification, an extension, a forbearance, whatever you want to call it, you're working with your borrower on an agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, in that agreement, make sure there's a release language, and you can also then beef up your default interest provision in there as well. So, so if you had old language in the documents, you can <clears throat> update it with this, with, with uh, the extension agreement. Yes, because when the borrower comes to you and, and wants that forbearance or that modification, they're, they're still your friend and you're working with them and you guys are cooperative and they're willing to, I'm not saying sign anything, but uh, a release is very common, something you, to put into a modification or forbearance. So that's a great time to put it in there. And that release is going to release you from any exposure, not just in relation to default interest, but anything else, mm -hmm. the origination of the loan, all the way through the date it's being signed. So you've now protected yourself on anything you've done servicing wise or origination wise up through this date. Um, oh, that's so you want to, that's yeah, smart. So you want to include that release, not just in default interest, but in general. Okay. And you want to beef up your default interest rate language through the modification. Uh, and also the other thing unrelated to what we're talking about, but if you're doing a mo uh, modification or forbearance, also have them restate the owner occupancy that is not owner occupied and restate that this was a business purpose loan. Because we are seeing a ton of litigation right now where borrowers thought they they got the bridge loan and they thought they'd get a better loan to, to pay you off and they're not able to because the rates went up. Yeah, so yeah. What they're doing is they're they're suing saying, no, this was a consumer loan. And even though they signed all these documents saying it was business purpose, they're suing now saying, no, this was you knew this was owner occupied or mm -hmm. you knew this wasn't really a business purpose loan. So to, to protect you from yourself from that is when you're giving them that extension modification forbearance, the release in there, and then having them restate that this is not owner occupied, restate this was a business purpose um, loan helps you out a lot in that regard. That, that I, I think if I'm, my number one takeaway from today, other than learning more about this, is that, um, that, that uh, getting that provision into extension agreements. Because right now we're seeing a lot of extension agreements for that very fact that, you know, the, the exit was a refinance. They thought they were going to get lower rates. It affected their, how much they could refinance the property. And so now that they're just going in and extending the loan, but that's important to have that language in that extension agreement. That's something that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to look into. Thank you for sharing. Um, so you asked how, how to protect yourself. There's three, three things I said. Number one was, you know, beef up your language. Number two is use the modification extension for parents as an opportunity to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. The third is don't, don't, do, don't violate the law, which is don't demand default interest on the entire unpaid principal balance following a payment default. You know, that's the best thing you can do it, yep. to protect yourself is don't be greedy and don't, don't ask, don't slap that default interest on the entire unpaid principal balance. Okay. That's the best well, thing you can do. Robert, it, again, this is, I, I could be on this, I, I could be on this webinar all day with you. And, and there are just thousands and thousands of different situations that we could go through and, and talk about. Obviously, laws and, and regulations in the state of California um, are, are always changing. And it's important to have, you know, uh, somebody you can talk to, a, a good counsel, good attorney. Um, with that, can I have you kind of just give us a broad overview of how we should be treating general uh, default interest generally and, and when they should be bringing in an attorney to, to kind of uh, bounce ideas off. Yeah. I mean, not this is self -prom uh, promotion for all attorneys, but we, we you know, we're, we're, it's a lot cheaper to reach out to us before a problem than after a problem. So Agreed. I would, I would reach out to your attorney um, before ever charging default interest. And I, you know, rather than take what I said here, I, I, I um, you know, talk to your attorney or, talk, or if you don't have one, talk to us and ask them, okay, here's my scenario. This is what we get a couple times a week. Here's my scenario. Can I charge default interest? And I walk you through, it takes, doesn't take all that long. And I explain, this is what you can't do. This is what you can do. Here's where, you, you know, depending on your level of aggressiveness, 
here's what you might want to try or you might not want to try. And um, um, and then if you are going to charge default interest, uh, uh, and, and if the loan's not matured and you want to charge it upon acceleration, there are steps you want to go through. There are specific notices that you want to send out mm -hmm. uh, to protect yourself as far as here, telling the borrower, here's what I'm going to be doing, and then um, charging your default interest from the date of that acceleration. So all of that stuff you should talk to your attorney about. It's not a, it's not super expensive. Most of the time, you know, it's a 15, 20 minute call, uh, unless it's your first rodeo, and then it might be a little bit longer, but uh, definitely talk to your attorney beforehand. I can absolutely tell you, you want to talk to an attorney uh, before the fact, because it will be less expensive. I've been involved in uh, some cases where it became extremely expensive and it, it could have probably uh, been dealt with on the front end for much, uh, for, for much cheaper. So, um, so Robert, with that, can you share your con? How can people get in contact with you? What's the best way to reach out to you? Uh, yeah. So um, Robert Finley and it's F I N L A Y. And my mm -hmm. email address, I'll give it to you twice is R then my last name, F I N L A Y. Mm -hmm. uh, most Finleys are EY. I'm an AY. Yep. At right legal, W R I G H T legal.net. Mm -hmm. So again, it's R Finley at right legal.net. And then my number is 949 477 5050. 949 477 5050. Um, and and if, if we have a minute, Brock, a, a couple of things popped in my head. Yeah, and, go ahead. Um, as far as questions I get, my mind was going through what people call and ask me. Um, one, one thing, you know, one question I get is, you keep talking about charging default interest on the entire unpaid principal balance. Yep. What if I charged it on something less than the entire unpaid principal balance? That's a question I got. So million dollar loan, Honshru yep. says I, there's a payment default. Honshru says I can't charge default interest on the full unpaid principal balance of 1 million. What if I charge it on 500,000? The Honshu case didn't address that. I think that would put us back in the initial uh, uh, um, um, playing field of is there a reasonable relationship or not. But some judges may disagree and say, no, Honshu, you know, you're getting cute. You know, Honshu covers that scenario. <clears throat> that said, here's how I think it plays out. If 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 one of my clients or, or a private lender out there charges default interest on 10% of the unpaid principal balance, so on $100,000. And that case makes it up to the court, you know, makes it to a court. Mm -hmm. I think we might end up with a different decision. I think, you know, you might end up oh, with really? a court saying, okay, yeah, Honshu said you can't do it on 100% of the unpaid principal balance, but I only did it on 10%. And now they'll look at whether or not it, there's a reasonable relationship. I how, think how would you come to 10% though? I mean, is it? I'm just picking, I'm just picking a number. But, but I mean, reasonably, if you, uh, <clears throat> the judge were to say, why 10%, not 50% or 99%? Well, it's, it, could could you make an argument and say, well, I, I no, I, I think it, it. I don't think a judge is going to complain that you chose arbitrarily ten percent, as long as your docs allow it. Some docs don't allow, it, and that's one of the things we beef up is some docs say you your only option is charging on the entire unpaid principal balance. Okay, and they don't give you that op, you know, that up to. That's how we changed it. Was just now it says up to the okay. entire unpaid principal balance. So I think if you charge it on ten percent and you got, it, I, I don't think Honshu controls. I could be wrong. I don't think it controls. But if you get, try to get cute and you try to charge it on 95% or 99% and you say, ha, Honshu said I can't do it on the whole unpaid principal balance, a judge is going to not like that. They think you're gonna, they're going to think you're being cute and you're trying to get around that, step, that, that law and they're going to slap you and you're going to lose. Between 10% and 90%, I don't know, 50%, I take the argument that Honshu doesn't apply, but is the judge going to agree with me? I don't know. Um, at least I can make an argument there. But so generally when clients call with that question, I tell them it, it, it's getting a little cute and it's a little dangerous, but if you drop down to 10, you know, drop down low 10% of your unpaid principal balance, now you're giving me a facts that I like taking to court and facts that might get us a good case. So Interesting. Uh, can't, again, I can't promise you're going to win, but that that's a question I get and that's the answer I usually give. Okay. Um, the other one is, is there a legislative fix? So this court, this case came out um, from a court ruling. And um, we got tons of calls, the you know, CMA, everyone's like, what, you know, can you get your, can you fix this? Go to, go to the legislature. I talked to our lobbyists, had extensive conversations um, with the CMA lobbyists and some other lobbyists as well. And the feeling is that 
if we were to propose something like 5% default interest is allowable, mm -hmm. that all the consumer groups would, would jump on it. And given the super majority of Democrats that are in um, uh, in Sacramento and their, their, their pro-consumer mindset, anti-lender mindset, that if we propose something, we probably would get uh, the, the, the our bill would be changed into something that is a complete ban on all default default so all default interest. So that's why we're not trying to get a legislative fix. Uh, the, some of the lobbyists think that if we did, it, the it would, it would it way flip and the way a complete ban on all default interest. So that's why we're not going in for a legislative fix. Okay. So uh, just a side note again, where we were ending this, but but you couldn't structure this as. Uh, I guess you're kind of getting to that point. All legal fees are covered, but I mean that that kind of you've already done that in the loan documents. Uh, you know, guarantee that all legal fees will be covered. But you yeah, already, you that, already, yeah, we we, we played with some loan docs for one client um, that was your interest rate's fifteen percent, but we'll give you a good payment discount. Yeah, oh, you get me that. down to ten percent, <laughs> and um, uh, it it. If, if done properly, it may be upheld, it may not be, but it got into a whole lot of problems as far as the disclosures go. And then also from a, from a marketing standpoint, Brock, if you're going to your borrower and you're saying your loan's 15% and someone else has given them 10, even though you could explain the good payment discount, yeah, yeah, yeah. Concept, it's not a good sales tactic, I'm sure. I, I think um, the, the last thing question we get for, from investors who maybe invest in loans outside of California is, does this affect them in other states? Um, no. So this is a California issue. Now, mm -hmm. default interest in other states, uh, I don't know what they charge. I, I we, we have an office in Nevada, and, and I know what they what, what's allowed there, but I'm not going to go into all those other states. But what I'll tell you is what we, everything I've talked about today is California only. Yeah, you're based. Okay. Now, I will also tell you because people try people call and say, okay, well, I'm going to make um, my 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 loans. Nevada uh, law controls because you can put in your agreements that Nevada law, New York law, you know, okay. controls. Unless your borrowers from Nevada and you're in Nevada, it's probably not going to work. Because I, I had clients that come in and say, "Well, I'm, 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 um, I'm just going to make my choice yeah. of law provision Nevada, and therefore I'll be okay." Uh, and I said, it pro "It's not if your borrowers in California, your properties in California." It's probably it's probably not going to work. That's interesting. I would have thought it was just being that the fact that the property is in California, the loan was written for a property in California, you'd have to meet California guidelines. But it, it generally does. The only scenario that that I would feel comfortable with is if your borrower is in Nevada, and you, the lender, are in Nevada, and you could okay. then I think you got a decent argument. Uh, and I'm just picking Nevada, but it could be Washington, it could be anywhere else. But okay. uh, yeah, so you can't don't try to get cute and get around it that way. Okay. Well, Robert, that's why I have you on. You, you're you're full of full of great information. Again, we could be here for hours and hours on on chatting about this, uh, uh, all of this information. So, thanks again for coming on. Um, definitely have you on in the future. So, with that, um, just a quick reminder: I'm going to send out an email to everybody. It'll have Robert's contact information, his phone number, and his email. I highly recommend Robert. I really uh, find it interesting when he come uh, when he speaks at the California Mortgage Association conferences. Um, he does bring a lot of good content. So highly recommend, Robert. Thanks again for coming on. Uh, we'll My be pleasure. posting this webinar on our uh, Talamar Financial uh, YouTube channel. Um, definitely subscribe to the channel so you get, um, so you get a note that, that we posted new content on there. Give this a like. Uh, and then last, I'm going to finish out. As many of you know, uh, we've started a magazine, Investor Insights. Uh, the magazine goes into... Uh, invest, you know, it provides content and information about investing in trustees, investing in mortgages, uh, mortgage funds and whatnot in the state of California. We have a lot of great content uh, written in there, uh, especially from, from other vendors. So uh, legal information, servicing information, um, anything in there is going to be in this. If you're interested in signing up, uh, just reach out to me and I'll make sure that you get on our distribution list so you get this goes out quarterly. So uh, uh, thanks again, Brock. Can I? I'm, I'm reaching out to you right now. Yep. <laughs>
sign, sign me up. Oh, I'll send you. Yes, absolutely. Right, and uh, we'll reach out to you to get you get uh, write an article for, for the magazine. So right. uh, love to have some content in there with from you. So uh, Robert, thanks again. And uh, uh, thanks for everybody for participating and for yeah asking those great questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. And thanks for the questions. The questions were nice. And take away, last thing, take away, don't be greedy. That, that is true. <laughs> All right. Take care.